Okay, so firstly, big thanks to, thank you to um, to Kevin and Costas for inviting me to speak. Um, I um, when I started putting together this talk, um, I had a, a worrisome feeling that the crowd was going to feel like they were coming to something where you would learn absolutely everything there is to know about stem cells and genome engineering. You're not even going to learn everything you need to know about stem cells and genome engineering. But I hope what you get out of this at the end is that at your next dinner party, you are the most well-informed, <laughs> as long as you're not all together. <laughs> And, um, and that you come away thinking that this type of science in particular is just so rad and cool and groovy. Um, and it's just such a privilege to work in this area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the very basics that surround genome engineering, a genome engineering 101, if you will, um, and then do the same with stem cells. Um, and this normally takes two or three weeks when you're doing lectures to honors students, so forgive me, it's going to be a bit of an avalanche of thoughts. But then what I'm going to do, and this is particularly brave, um, uh, Costas and Kevin asked me to talk about modeling disease in a dish. And I'm actually going to be that scientist that's brave enough to tell you a little bit about what we are doing in the lab here in South Africa um, using the, these two technologies. So bear with me. Right. Hopefully. Right. So we're going to start with this. This is Leila. <clears throat> when this picture was taken at the end of 2015, she was one year old, one years old. And she had been diagnosed about six months before with a very severe type of leukemia. And they'd thrown absolutely everything, the kitchen sink, at this disease for her. And it wasn't working. And there were the doctors at Great Ormond Street were at the end of their tether. There was nothing else they could do. And then one of them recalled that a, a French-based company called Selectus that was doing some genome engineering work had genetically modified some T cells. It's a type of blood cell. And they'd engineered these cells to specifically produce this little gene product targeting a thing called CD19. It's not too important what that is. Suffice to say that CD19 is something that's expressed on cancer cells. And they were like, if we put these T cells that have been modified with this thing in her, it will target her cancer cells. Great, good plan. Big problem, though the T cells weren't hers. And they couldn't take T cells out of her to genetically engineer them to express this little marker because she didn't have enough. So they got quite clever, and with the guys with Selectus, they took those T cells out and they genetically modified them a second time so that they didn't contain that, that immune mismatch recognition sequence. And they put these in her, and as of 18 months later, to the best of my knowledge, she's doing alive and well. One of the things, they did this with the second patient about six months later. One of the things I want you to get from this is that the combination of genome engineering with cellular therapy is going to start curing things that were completely refractive to any kind of therapy before. This is the power of genome engineering. And it's, it's incredible what potential this work has if we do it properly. So let's go to the basics. <laughs> genome engineering 101. You thought I was joking. I really wasn't. <laughs> okay. So genome engineering really comes down to one very simple thing. If you imagine, and forgive me, this is, a, this is the sort of the dogma that we used in undergrad, um, but it's helpful for examples like this. Your DNA, most of us understand, this is the blueprint that exists in every single cell in our body, okay? By and large, the sequence in every single cell is exactly the same. That DNA gets replicated when the cell divides. Fairly straightforward. Then there's an intermediate step. It makes a little piece of RNA, little bits of code are read off, and that RNA gets turned into protein. These are the workhorses of the cell. These are the things that go and do stuff, mostly good stuff, okay? If there is a mistake here, if there is a change in your DNA, and it's in an important region, it will change what this protein does, okay? Sometimes the mistake can be something as simple as a, a few nucleotides that are missing, and that can switch off production of this protein. Sometimes it can be a massive deletion. Sometimes it can be a massive insertion. Sometimes it can be a single nucleotide change. One base pair will change, 
and this protein will suddenly develop a, a mutated form and cause disease. So whatever is in here dictates what comes afterwards. And importantly, any change that occurs in your DNA is permanent in the cells that divide from it afterwards. That's a really important concept to get from this. So in terms of basics, what you need to understand about genome engineering is that in compared to previous gene therapy strategies, genome engineering is a little bit like just handing your, your molecular um, therapy GPS coordinates. It tells you where you're going to go into the cell. So what I mean by that, if you have a pair of, and when I talk about genome engineering, in the lab we talk about endonucleases, okay? That's the name of the protein that does the cut. But basically they're called molecular, they're like molecular scissors. Imagine them like that. And if you target them to a specific sequence in your DNA, they will break the DNA at that point. When you do that, the cell freaks out. It is the worst insult that you can give to a cell. And it's got two decisions. It's going to die, it'll kill itself, or it fixes that piece of DNA as quickly as it can. So imagine it being like a tethered rope and it's trying to seal that together as quickly as possible. So it sends in this um, sort of like the first cavalry, a little bit disorganized. It's called an error prone repair system. And they go in there and they just put things back together. They just want to reseal it. But the problem is oftentimes when they reseal, they reseal incorrectly. It'll add a few nucleotides, insertions or delete a few nucleotides called deletions, and we call this an indel. When this happens, the subsequent piece of DNA, if it's not, in not a, an important area of the genome, it might be okay, but if it's in the middle of a coding region of a gene, it can stop that gene from being formed completely. So this is one of the strategies that we use in cutting out a protein completely and permanently. Then we've got a, another strategy, because that initial cavalry, cavalry is a little bit disorganized. So what we try to do is we say, okay, we're sending in these molecular scissors, cut the DNA where we tell you to cut the DNA, but this time, don't make your little crazy little repair strategy and just try and reseal. We're going to give you a template, and we want you to fix that piece of DNA exactly as we've instructed you to. And this is relatively simple to design, easier for my colleagues, less good for me. But it's, you can add anything you want you are almost unlimited in the change that you want to make at that particular region. So you could, for instance, add a whole gene, if it's not too big. You could change a nucleotide, okay? So change the way a protein acts. You could repair a mutation. You can actually fix monogenic diseases now. We know exactly how to do it. If you know what the mutation is, we can repair it. And every subsequent cell that has been repaired from this will carry that repair. Right. So why is it such, why the big hoo-ha at the moment? We've been doing genome engineering for decades. Zinc finger nucleases have been around for a while. Talons have been around for a little bit longer. But it's this one, CRISPR, that came out about five years ago, um, discovered by Charpentier and Dudna. And what they did was that they were doing some basic science research and looking at bacterial defense mechanisms. And essentially what they did was they found a new type of, a new pair of molecular scissors. And it's called the CRISPR-Cas9 system. I don't want you to worry too much about it, but what I really want to get across to you is that the reason why this is on the headlines of Time magazine and in um, newspapers and whatnot and has come to the public attention more so than any of the others before, is that all you need to be able to design is 20 base pairs, 20 nucleotides, and you can target any region of the genome that you want. Okay? The previous molecular scissors that I spoke about were so complex to design, very few labs could actually execute the work. This, anyone can do. And for those of you who aren't scientists, and aren't in a molecular biology lab, lab, it would be akin to putting up an Excel spreadsheet and writing a sum formula in with a certain number of blocks. It, it, it really can be that simple to use. So that's the Cas9 system. So now you know everything about genome engineering. <laughs> Done. <laughs> I'll bring in a little bit more later. So stem cells 101. Okay, stem cells evokes a lot of ideas from different people. Um, I'm going to give you talk about a few different types of them. There are a myriad of them, 
myriad of them, but I'm just going to tell you about three that are pertinent to the work that I want to talk about here. And if you've got any questions about the others, I'm happy to answer um, later. So there are what we call tissue stem cells. They're also called adult stem cells. So these are the ones that exist in our body, and everyone here in this room has them, and they're doing pretty good jobs. They're in just about every single tissue in your body. Um, and they can be used, and, and to a degree, hematopoietic, so hematopoietic stem cells, the ones in your blood, we can pull those out. There's some other mesenchymal stem cells. Those are helpful for treatments. But those, those are the one kind that are going to come up in the talk. The other kind are embryonic stem cells, briefly. And this evokes a lot of ethical dilemmas and whatnot. But essentially, these are cells that come from fertilized zygotes. And from that, we can get um, pluripotent stem cells, which we grow up in the lab in the dish. And they can become any cell type in the body. Okay? The new kid on the block, relatively new kid on the block, um, are induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs. Now, these are very cool because you can take a skin biopsy about the size of a freckle on my arm, grow up those skin cells in the dish, okay, and reprogram to become stem cells. And for all intents and purposes, they act exactly the same way as embryonic stem cells. There are differences, but you can make them do that. Um, and I'm going to explain to you why that's such a remarkable thing. So this is my favorite diagram in biology, okay? Um, if uh, my honest students are here, I'd make them tell me what it is. This is Waddington's landscape. He was a biologist um, in the last century in the UK. And he came up with this concept of, he referred to it as cellular plasticity. But I don't want you to worry about that too much, but I just want you to focus. You've got a ball at the top of a mountain range of valleys. And those valleys will land up, depending on which route you take, you will land up in a different place. Okay? And if gravity really essentially is your only sort of force pulling you down, once you are down here, you can't go up and then over back here. You can't then move up and go around here. So imagine that ball falling down that valley. Once it goes down one particular route, to a degree, its fate has been decided. We call it cellular fate. It can't go up and around. It's still got some options. It can either go here or it can either go here, but its fate has been determined to a degree. In the same way, stem cells can be seen in exactly the same light. If you are an embryonic stem cell up here, you can become anything you want to become. You can become a cardiomyocyte. You can become a skin cell. If you are a tissue stem cell, those ones I showed you before that we all have in our body, we also call them multipotent, they're kind of sitting around here. So if you're here and you're a hematopoietic stem cell, you can become a white blood cell, you could become a red blood cell, but you cannot become a beating heart cell. Very sad. Your fate has been determined. That's one of the reasons why those adult stem cell treatments aren't as... I should actually leave this as a question for later. But just bear in mind when you, when you come across them and you're reading in the news and, and whatnot, adult stem cells are sitting here. Pluripotent stem cells like embryonic stem cells are up here. So where do induced pluripotent stem cells fit in? Well, they were here. They were skin cells. Skin cells can't become anything else. But what happened was that Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for this, he discovered it in 2007 and was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2012. It's five years for recognition of a discovery. He worked out which genes you need to give the skin cells that push them all the way back up here. And that's why they're called induced pluripotent stem cells. Okay. I think we're done with STEMIs. No. Okay, there's a little bit more. Right. So now what we need to do, now that you know everything about stem cells and everything about genome engineering, we need to combine the two to explain how you could use this therapeutically. So if you imagine for any one particular disease, um, and I'm going to try and think of one, we'll choose a blood disorder. Beta thalassemia is a good one, for example. There's a known genetic mutation, so we want to target that. What you can do is you can take the molecular scissors that you've made with your little donor template that you've has got the correction. So you're saying, I want you to go and cut the beta thalassemia gene near where that mutation is. I want you to add this template and fix it. And you put it in a, a little a viral vector just to keep it um, all together and get it to the right cells. And you inject it straight into the patient. And you hope that your molecular scissors and your little t template get to enough of the blood cells to get inside, correct the gene, 
and to correct enough of those cells to have an improvement in disease. That's one way you can combine genome engineering um, in cellular treatment. But the difficulty with that is that you can't actually predict how many, how many cells you're going to fix. Because really, what you really want to do is you want to fix them all. Okay? There are threshold levels, and we can talk about that later, about sickle cell and whatnot. But you want to fix as many of them as you can. But that's hard if you're injecting things into a patient and hoping that, that molecular scissors, those molecular scissors are going to get to the right place. So we've got another thing called ex vivo editing. This is in vivo, so inside the body. Ex vivo is to take out, okay? And essentially what happens is that, let's say you've got another disease. I'm going to try and think of um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, for example, okay? So now you've got a problem with some skeletal muscle and, and cardiac muscle. If you could take certain cells out of the body, adult stem cells, certain type might work, grow those up, correct them, in, the, in a dish, in the lab, using the molecular scissors, using the donor template that you've added, then you can select all the ones that have been repaired. Some of them won't be. So you just pull out the ones that have been corrected, you grow the corrected ones up, and you put them back in. Okay? I make it sound very easy. The advantage with this, the great advantage with using someone's adult stem cells or their own cells to repair, is that there's no immune problem because you're taking cells out, fixing them, you're just correcting the small mutation and putting them back in. The difficulty is that not all adult stem cells are easy to um, pull out of a body. They also can be pretty tricky to grow in a dish. So that's where induced peripotent stem cells come in. You could take a skin biopsy, so it's just a tiny, tiny little biopsy. You can use Yamanaka's factors to turn them into stem cells. You correct them exactly the same way. Molecular scissors, donor templates, select for the correct ones. And now you can turn them into any cell type you want. So for diseases that have multiple cell types that are damaged, you've now got the, the initial, you've got that, that ball at the top of Waddington's landscape, and you can say, we need cardiomyocytes that are fixed, we need skeletal muscle that's fixed, what else? And you can make all of those and then put them back in. Okay. So that's a huge advantage with this type of stem cell work. Do I still have you? <laughs> okay. Right. Let's keep going. Okay. So before I get brave and start telling you about how we're using these technologies in, in our lab, um, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the most advanced work that's ongoing with trials because I think that gets everyone quite excited about what's really happening. Um, I'm going to use one or two examples. Um, the first example involves a little gene called CCR5 and you understanding a little thing about the plague. So when researchers in the early 80s were still figuring out that HIV causes AIDS, they had obviously massive numbers of patients, they were looking at control samples and whatnot, and some of their control individuals who weren't showing any symptoms of, H of AIDS whatsoever, um, if they dug deep into their lymph nodes, they could actually find remnants of HIV. They could find very, very low copy numbers of HIV. Well, this didn't really make any sense. These people weren't on any kind of treatment. How on earth were they controlling their own viral replication levels? And it turned out after they'd done a number of sequencing studies that some of these, a lot of these individuals have a mutation in the CCR5 gene. I'm going to take a minute to explain why that's important with HIV. When HIV comes and sort of starts attacking this very simplistic version of the HIV researchers in the audience, I apologize. But if you imagine HIV, it's kind of like a little bit of a Sputnik or something, and it gets to a, a blood cell, and it attaches, it needs to attach to two receptors. So one of them, it, it attaches to CD4, so it hangs on, but it kind of, it has to attach to an, a second one to stabilize so that the, um, the viral genome can get sort of um, pushed into the cell. If it can't attach to that second one, it can't push that, it can't actually infect that particular cell. And CCR5 is the second receptor. So there, I don't know how many people there are in this room. Um, there are a few. But if you are Caucasian, about 10% of you will have deletions in this gene. There are, so the individuals, that, um, they named these particular individuals elite controllers. Sounds like a Delta Force unit. But 
it is what they can do. They can they control levels of the virus on their own because they don't have this um, this gene working very well. Um, so what happened next? Oh, so they were trying to figure out why a, num a, a reasonably high percentage of Caucasian individuals have this. There are elite controllers in the um, in the African population, but they don't have this mutation. And it turns out that this mutation mutation was selected for during the plague. So in, in Europe, when that ravaged those countries, individuals who had this mutation were more likely to survive. The plague was less ravaging in sub-Saharan Africa, so the mutation wasn't selected for. It's really that simple. So now we know that if you don't have CCR5, you're probably you're reasonably healthy. There don't seem to be too many problems, so you can walk around and there's no issue. But you're completely refractive to H not completely. You're refractive to HIV um, by and large. So, so, so that's quite interesting actually, because now we can possibly knock out a gene, and that would make you immune to HIV. Okay. But there was another thing that happened. This is the Berlin patient, Tim Brown, and nearly 10 years ago. Um, he was HIV positive and then it developed um, leukemia, if I'm not mistaken. So they were going to have to do a um, completely re um, replace his bone marrow. And they said, well, if we're going to have to do this anyway. Why don't we do this and take it from an individual who doesn't have the CCR5 gene? And to this day, to the best of my knowledge, he's the only person who's been functionally cured of HIV. Okay. So now we know two things. We know that there are elite controllers who don't have this gene and they're okay. Tim Brown is doing fine. And this is where most of the trials for genome engineering are at the forefront. Okay. It's a blood disorder. So we know, we kind of know what we're doing when it comes to that from a systemic delivery point of view. Our research is, is fairly well advanced. Um, and all we have to do is stop the gene from working. So in essence, what you can do, and to a degree that w what we've done in the lab, you can knock out CCR5, and those cells can't be infected with HIV. So this is at the forefront of trials. The other thing that's at the forefront, we go back to um, little Layla, and that's CART. Um, so this is a cancer type treatment, um, and there are variations on a theme here. Um, it stands for chimeric antigen receptor and T cells. And again, they're doing a lot of their are variations of theme. There are loads of clinical trials ongoing with this at the moment. And basically what people are trying to do is take T cells from different types of individuals, add this gene to make sure that it knows to target cancer cells, remove, and then also remove something out of those T cells so that they won't recognize this foreign body that they've infected. Okay. And they're, they're different strategies. You can do allogeneic, you could do autologous. It gets expensive if you're trying to do this from your own T cells and repair everyone's. But imagine if you could find immune match groups and you could bulk these up. There's a lot of treatment options that you could do with this for, for, for cancers that haven't been able to be treated up until now. Okay, so those are at the forefront. What next? Okay, I'm gonna bring this up and I'm gonna bring it up briefly and we, there are questions if there needs to be questions. The problem with genome engineering at the moment, often in the public, because I can guarantee you I've not yet met a scientist who's like, who wants to go rogue on this with like a finger like this and a white coat and a cat or something. <laughs> they don't, well, if they exist, I've never met them. So scientists are actually remarkable individuals when they need to pull themselves towards themselves. And about a year ago, or two years ago, a year and a half, a group of scientists from all over the world, the States, France, the, um, China, the UK, Australia, some from South Africa, some of our colleagues as well, were called to a meeting, a meeting of minds. And they sat down for a week and they bashed out, should we call for a moratorium on genome engineering? Should we stop it? Because people are getting scared and we don't want the public to be scared. We want to have, make sure that we can make sure that all the safety things are, um, are on par and whatnot. And they finished the meeting with kind of a decision. And the decision was, all genome engineering is fine except for in embryos. There, there are some issues, okay? But each country has its own legislation, so they couldn't enforce that. But they made recommendations. Um, and one of the reasons why they, they pulled together this meeting fairly rapidly is that last year a paper was published where they did try to engineer human embryos. 
Um, there are ethical, there are reasons why they got away with it from an ethic point, ethics point of view. They actually tried to knock out the CCR5 gene, incidentally. They didn't do it very well. Um, but, um, but that was the concern that came up. So it's, it's an issue that comes up. Um, but one thing I will say to the audience at large is that I may not be the brightest person in the world, but I can tell you right now, I've yet to come across a single medical condition that could be treated by treating genetically engineering embryos that isn't available from a pre-implantation screening point of view now. And if there's anyone in the audience that knows one, then by all means, let me know. But I've yet to come across it. So there's no reason to be doing this at this stage. There are some fertility um, experiments and research that's ongoing in the UK. They've just been given permission. Um, and I don't know too much about that, but um, they're being very careful with the work that they are doing. So, ethics, done. <laughs> now I'm going to be very brave. I wanted to, um, in addition to Kevin and Costa saying, we want you to talk about modeling disease in addition. I was like, oh, crikey. Which one should I choose? I suddenly thought it might be valuable for you to know what we're doing here in this country um, using these techniques. So in order to explain why we are using genome engineering in stem cells, I need to explain a problem to you first. Oh, and before I say that, let me categorically say the model that I'm going to show you is not perfect. George Box said it best, statistician from the last century. No model is correct, but some are useful. But if we know what the flaws are in our model, despite our furthest intentions of making it as accurate as possible, we can still work with it and get good information out of it. So this is probably, for me, one of the best diagrams explaining the diversity, um, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. If we, I think most people are comfortable with the knowledge that about 100,000 years ago, there was a migration, okay? A very tiny, tiny part of the population left Africa and then, for all intents and purposes, repopulated the rest of the world. Turns out that there were actually three, but never mind. If you look at this diagram, you can see the enormous diversity that exists in sub-Saharan Africa compared to that which exists in the rest of the world. The other thing this diagram does, in addition to just giving you sort of um, width across here, the darker the blue, the more diversity within that group. The lighter, the less diversity. Okay, so that's this is fairly well established, and that's not a not an issue. But the problem is, is that, and I'm making generalizations here. I don't want to annihilate the drug companies at all because they've done some extraordinary things. But most of the drug trials are taking place in the West. Okay, so what population groups are they working on? Probably mostly Caucasian. Okay. Not a great deal of genetically diverse, not a great deal of genetic diversity there. So then what happens is that they make these drugs, the drugs work, the drugs are good, okay? They bring them here, but we have this incredible diversity of unique genetic variants that are going to change the way individuals in our population groups metabolize those drugs. In addition to which, we've got this massive HIV burden, TB burden, and an estimate from a group that published this last year, it's really hard to get an idea of how bad adverse drug reactions are. It's hard to measure. But they done a study in northern Gauteng hospitals, and they reckon that one in 12 individuals are going into hospitals because they are so sick, not from the disease, from the drugs that they are taking. That's how severe adverse drug reactions can be. So that obviously leads to a problem because now you've got people not taking the drugs that they really need to be taking. And if we're honest, those drug companies are unlikely to reassess all of those drugs on our population. They'll fail um, most of them at the first um, uh, trials or whatnot, safety standards. So what we've got to do is find a solution to the problem. And so the solution is find the dry, right drugs and make sure that that drug pipeline is shorter, faster, and cheaper. That's what you've got to do. So this is a slightly expensive, um, expensive, slightly complicated slide, but if you can imagine, we estimate that creating a new drug costs in the range of about a billion dollars per drug to make. What if we could reduce that cost to one million dollars? <laughs> and there is a way we can do that. If we can create models of disease in a dish, cells, in the, in the dish in the lab, then we've got, we, we could do multiple tests on these models and find better drugs 
that give us that shorter drug pipeline. So we can narrow down the list as long as we've got the right genetics and the right model. Okay. So this is what we're trying to do. We spent a lot of time thinking about the perfect model. We needed the right cell type. So basically we need liver cells. Okay. Because those are the things that are going to metabolize the drugs. We need the right genetics. We need things of, with an African genetic background, but we also want the little variations that we're looking for so that we know exactly what we've got. We want loads of cells because we are going to do experiments ad nauseum and we wanted to make sure we had a cheap assay. So we decided we had to make the model ourselves and we decided we were going to do that by genetically engineering them. Um, and I, ideally, what we wanted to create were liver cells that react perfectly normally to drugs, so they'll metabolize the drugs exactly as we would expect, and then genetically engineer and produce liver cells that couldn't, that have these unique African variants that could give us an idea of what a good metabolizer would be and what a poor metabolizer would be, and sprinkle these with loads of drugs to get data. So the problem with this is that when you're looking at cells, you can get liver biopsies, but they're actually quite hard to come by. They're pretty expensive. It's unusual to get healthy ones because by and large, when someone is opening you up and you're getting a liver biopsy, you probably don't have a healthy liver. And they don't last very long. So every time you need more cells, you have to get more. There is another type of um, cell that you can use. These are called transformed cell lines. Has anyone heard of The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks? The book, yeah, okay. HeLa cells are transformed cell lines. They've been growing for, what, 50, 60 years? Transformed cell lines you can take from different parts of the body. They Essentially, they, they're, they're cancerous. And you can get some from around the liver, for example. And they divide constantly. So they'll kind of act like maybe a liver cell. And they'll keep dividing. So there's that. But I want to show you what they look like when you look deep down. This is, this is a normal cell. Okay, this is a very healthy, most of the cells in your, hopefully all the cells in your body look like this. This is a karyotype. This tells you the number of chromosomes that you have in your body. And you don't have to be a cytogeneticist to recognize that you've got 23 pairs. Looking good. Okay, great. This is what HeLa cells look like. So again, excuse me. <coughs> you shouldn't have five copies of chromosome one. You shouldn't have one copy of chromosome 14, and I don't know what's going on with chromosome 10, but the authors of this paper called it chromosomal shattering. That's not good. Right, so that's what's happened when you use transformed cell lines. So we're not going to use those. Those are bad. Mm. But we can use induced pluripotent stem cells. And the reason we can do that, because now you guys know everything there is to know about stem cells, is you take any individual and you take the, a skin biopsy from them, you add the Yamanaka factors, and now you make <coughs> pluripotent stem cells. These cells do not stop dividing. The other thing is that they contain the exact genetics of the patient. Not only do they only have 23, copies, 23 pairs of chromosomes, which is good, they contain the exact genetics of the patient. So every time you get an indu uh, make an induced pluripotent stem cell from a different individual, they carry a living part of that person's genetics. So now you've got the accurate genetic background. Thank you so much. You can also turn them into any cell type you want. Remember, they're at the top of Waddington's landscape. So you can choose. So you can make loads and loads of cells. So there's an avenue of research that we can follow therapeutically. But what we're doing in the lab is slightly different. We're taking these and turning them into liver cells and using them as a drug toxicity screening assay. So... Now we've got, so we, we go to individuals of the correct genetic background. We take skin cells, we turn them into stem cells, and then we slowly, sorry, there's one or two things missing here, introduced genetic mutations as and when we want to do that. So e the only difference between each stem cell line that we have will be a mutation that we consider to be interesting, a SNP variant in one of the cytochrome genes a cytochrome gene that is responsible for metabolizing the number one antiretroviral rollout drug that we have in South Africa. We want to understand exactly how it alters the metabolism. We can do that. We can add more. We can add as many as we want. We can add them in different combinations. You turn those into liver cells. 
You sprinkle those with drugs, and now you have your model. You've used stem cells and genome engineering to create healthy liver cells in a dish and sick liver cells in a dish. And now you sprinkle them with every single drug that you can find to try and figure out how to measure good and bad metabolism. So the only thing that you need from there is to make sure that your stem cells are actually doing what you're doing. And I'm sorry this hasn't come out correctly. Um, so the stem cells that we made, we turn into neurons. So you can see their little DNA clusters here. And then you've got dendritic arborization, which is just a fancy way of saying sort of little neuronal outgrowths. We can do that. We can turn them into white blood cells. So this is sped up over time. White blood cells are really sweet. They've got these adorable little pseudopods that mop up all the stuff around them. Um, the DNA is the blue, and then the, the surface marker is this white, um, white gray-colored membrane marker. But they will do this for, I mean, they're doing it in the dish at the moment in the lab, So, and they're terribly sweet. This is sped up a little bit, but you can see them move in real time, and I have to be honest, I get a little bit mesmerized by it. Um, so those are really cool and really rad to work with. And then we work with these. There is some sound. Don't worry, it's just me breathing and I was trying to be quiet when I was recording. There are probably about two to 300 cardiomyocytes in this dish. When they make connections, um, they, they can talk to each other. Their calcium channels sort of talk to each other. And they will beat synchronously like this for up to a year if I remember to feed them. All of these cell types I've shown you are from the stem cells that we've made that came from a tiny piece of skin. Okay, this is what you can do with induced pluripotent stem cells. I think that was one of my students saying, that is enough. Okay, we can go on to the next one now. Thanks. Okay. So now we've got these amazing stem cells, and we know that these stem cells can turn into anything. So we've made that, and we've made them from an individual of of the correct genetic background. And then what we had to do was identify a drug toxicity genetic variant. So we identified one of the main antiretrovirals in South Africa, and then we found a SNP, uh, a, a genetic variant. If you have in one of your cytochrome genes the G, you're fine. It's no problem. Good on you. You can metabolize the drug. If you've got a T, you are in trouble, okay? Just to give you an idea of the differences in the different populations, a Finnish populations are obviously Caucasian, I would imagine largely. They only have 16% of, their popula of, of the presence of the T allele. In a Kenyan population group, they have 36. Okay, That might not sound like a big difference, but when you throw in a massive HIV burden, this is going to create a problem. So this is why we chose this particular one. So what we're doing at the moment is genetically modifying our cells using our little molecular scissors. We have a bit of a problem. So just remember there are two copies of every gene. So our particular person has a T and a G, which was frustrating because I didn't have to fix it both ways. Um, so that's what we're doing at the moment is we're engineering. And so we've got a couple of these going now at the moment. So we added the molecular scissors. We've added the, the donor template to say, don't repair it any way you want. Just replace the T with the G. I want this exact change. We've got that, and we're working on creating our poor metabolizer. And now we have isogenic stem cells. So all we need to do now is turn them into liver. That happened really fast. I don't know why I did that. But that, whoa. That first picture was stem cells. These are liver cells that we're growing in the dish. Okay. So then the last thing I just want to talk to you a little bit about is work that I'm not capable of doing, but I um, work alongside the most amazing individuals, and Geraldine Naidu is one of the person who does our imaging work. So imagine now that we've made these liver cells, and we've got the good metabolizers and the poor metabolizers, with only a single nucleotide difference between the two of them, and we've got huge amounts of them. So what are you going to do? Well, we're going to look at the way they express certain genes so we can get an idea of how they react to certain drugs. So it might look like this. The red here is the nucleus. The green is a protein being expressed. So that's great, okay? But we want to do more than just one image, right? We want to do a little bit more than that. We want to make sure that we're looking at cells that are killed, cells that react differently. There are variations on a theme. But I don't want to do 12 examples. I want to do this in a 96 well plate because I want replicates, right? And every time I do this, 
I want to make sure that they're all reacting the same way um, and, get, and have different concentrations of the drugs, different drugs. But I don't want to just do it in a 96 well plate. I want to do it in hundreds of them. And that's what some of the people in the lab that I work with are capable of doing. I just make the cells. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to end. Um, I just wanted to leave you with a lasting thought. And that is that I'm aware of the fact that we often feel a little bit dumbed down um, because we're just South Africans and we're not doing phenomenal research all over the world. And I know some of the work I spoke to you about at the beginning is incredible because it's sort of mind-blowing. But we still have the capability of harnessing um, some pretty powerful technologies. And what I hope I've shown you is that we are using that, both genome engineering and the stem cell work that we do. So with that, I'm just going to say thank you and this is my lab that I work in. And some of the people that I'm going to be cross that I chose funny photos of them, but they're really sweet. So these are the most phenomenal individuals. I can possibly, uh, I can't even speak highly about them enough. I'm very lucky to work with them. I'll end, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. <laughs>